So um, absent a question from Natalie, um, I'd like to return to um, the speculation on, um, on the impact of AlphaFold and, and that uh, Cynthia lead off. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think it has, first of all, it has incredible immediate utility uh, for structural studies in defining constructs that are worth pursuing because it does seem to highlight uh, areas that are difficult to predict, which might, which might represent regions of the protein that are simply unstructured, at least on their own. And then help in interpreting, you know, maps, you know, cryo EM maps. I mean, we saw some gorgeous maps today. I mean, John's the ATPAs, those those are unbelievable. But you know, often we have very disordered regions of maps, and you know, not much except sort of some sort of blob. And so AlphaFold would have immediate utility in helping to interpret those, but it's pretty clear it's heading in a direction where it will become more sophisticated and be able to predict structures of co-folding domains. Um, so it's very exciting. It could really fa fast track even more structural studies that have already been propelled so far, as you know, Stephen, just by the availability of so many individual structures in the PDB that allow you to put together some gigantic complex that you've determined by cryo -EM. Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I agree. Um, Erica, do you have, you're, you're a, a long, long time electron microscopist. What are your thoughts? Well, actually, I'm a long time crystallographer picking up EM because my proteins inherently don't crystallize. For some of them, we grew 50,000 crystals to find two that would diffract. They're so heavily glycosylated. And so as a result, my lab very much needs and uses both techniques as well as designing an antigen that we need to get the structure. And then the antigen, that by antigen, I mean like the, the viral protein, that tends to be a good vaccine or a good diagnostic. So we're kind of bridging all of those things together. And I think it's important to have access to all the tools because you never know what the biological question is going to require if you have something that you can get the resolution and reproducibility of crystals if you need that and if you have something that's transient or that inherently by its biology occupies multiple oligomeric states and multiple transient conformations and you want to see that variability you need that you know some of our viral surface proteins have different sugars in different places at different times and that's really important to understand for understanding mean response and so you need to be able to visualize heterogeneity and you need to capture resolution. You need to put all those back together. Speaking of new techniques, uh, Mike, you, um, you presented some very elegant work that I think has only begun to scratch the, the surface in terms of its potential. Thank you. Your thoughts? Um, I mean, for us, it's, it's very exciting as you can get a model where you didn't have a model before. Um, one of the really fun things I've been doing with AlphaFold, which I'm, I'm sure everyone has, is to look at all of the crystal structures we've gotten by using antibodies to get the crystal structure in the first place that didn't work when we went from zebrafish to human or something like that and going, ah, this loop loop looks like it will be in the way now. Clearly it won't work. And this is giving, uh, you know, immediately tweeting some ideas about uh, what everyone has been talking about, Cynthia and, and Erica, about new constructs or new approaches to, to get these answers and, and really get down to why these function differently and why we see activity that's different. And it's, it's very exciting. I think Jane Richardson has a question. Jane, would you like to unmute yourself? accidentally left over from before, but I do have a point I'm interested in, that as software developers for crystallography and IOEM, Phoenix Group feels that one of the most important changes is that basically this has almost solved the molecular replacement, uh, by molecular replacement solves the phase problem in general. These structures are almost always good enough uh, to get a good molecular replacement solution, even for things where there are no templates. So that's another place where this is, is being revolutionary. 
And that's is actually part of the Rosetta Fold paper, actually, is those analyses. Yes, yeah, there were some, uh, there were some cases that had resisted molecular replacement, which succumbed with a, with a computed structure model from Rosetta Fold. Just coming back to this idea of being able to capture the conformational spectrum and the importance of dynamics in, in these, some of these binding events. Or, um, I'd be curious to know, uh, as our detectors are getting faster and faster and we can collect bigger and bigger populations, have any of you attempted to try to capture these subpopulations of conformational states, like cryo-EM, for example? We've done a lot of variability analysis and how our big flexible immune and virus complex is today. We can see a lot of wonderful snapshots in progress and see what the different populations are and understand why some therapeutics are and are not as effective as we thought. And it has to do with the, the variability states. We can have, when we can get enough particles, we can actually have enough to bin them and look at them. And it, that complexity is real and it's biological and it's what actually happens in cells. And it's, it's a magnificent thing that we can now see it. I think I think also for um, you know for complex assemblies that may sort of assemble stepwise or may have substates. I mean, we've captured uh, not in published data, but you know we've captured a large complex and then subcomplexes, uh, which may you know it's it's hard to tell if that's a you know if that's an assembly state or you know off you know off pathway, but you know it gives you that information about what the subcomplexes and potential assembly states are, and that's information you could test from there. Certainly when you work on large protein complexes, it's the rule, not the exception, that everything has conformational variability and compositional variability. And I think that's that's where a lot of the interesting biology now lies, and there are neat methods being developed to, to deal with that. Uh, Vladek Miner had a his hand up. Would you like uh, to unmute, Vladek? Uh, yes, I unmuted. Uh, Erika, you, I would like to come back to collaborations. I think that the key to success in science is to find good collaborators. And clearly it was not what you presented. I remember it was not first, your first collaboration. You organized, or you were one of the organizers of several what is your secret, if you would like to disclose your secret? I just spend a lot of time on the phone talking to people and understanding what they need and what they're worried about. Because for each individual, it's different. You know, a company may be more worried about the risk to their therapeutic. The biotech is more worried about how do I get attention on my molecule? And different academics have different things they're worried about and different scars and joys from previous collaborations. And so you just have to spend a lot of time being really direct and straightforward and upfront and saying, this is what we have to offer. This is what you have to offer. What's the right alignment? Okay, now here's a potential risk where we're going to have lots of people that are all going to want to be first author. How do we, how do we make there be multiple papers so everybody gets one? And I think that's a mindset that you have to adopt. People think about if we subdivide the pie, I have a smaller piece. But the way to look at it is, how do we get a second pie? If there's more pie, everybody can have the same piece. <laughs> and you know, you'd rather be co-first author on four papers maybe than on one. So you have to find a way of having more pie. And the more pie could be more resources, it could be more tools, it could be um, taking the data, looking at it different ways. And so, so one of the, so people were worried if I give you the molecule that I can't write a paper on it. The answer is no, no, you write the paper from your own lab, right? How you discover it, you write it under its real name. You write it using the assays you have. You have all that paper, all that stuff in your paper, but you're also on all these other papers because that molecule isn't called its real name, it's called 28. And you can participate in this greater analysis, looking at things a different way. And then the carbohydrate chemist can write a paper analyzing the carbohydrate chemistry of this data set in this tool population that was only made possible by finding them together. And the structural biologist can write a paper about what is the structural biology that we see here. And so it's making more opportunities and making more pie. Thank you, uh, Vladek, and thank, thank you, Erica. Uh, could we turn briefly to um, 
the higher resolution, more chemically oriented um, uh, presenters. And um, as both Squire and Raphael, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about the potential impact of AI on understanding small molecule binding to large molecules. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is Squire. I'm, I'm particularly excited about uh, using AI to look for, um, for potential drugs, compounds that inhibit certain enzymes that, that we study. And so, uh, you know, we're working with, with people in that, in that area. Um, you know, for the things that we do, which are highly mechanistic, um, we really need structures that have cofactors present as well as substrates bound. And I mean, we're looking at, you know, where hydrogens are, you know, with respect to, you know, different things, because they can make all the, all the difference in a, in a mechanism. So, um, you know, I've looked at, like, you know, I don't know how the program handles, for example, these iron sulfur clusters. I don't know if the program can even predict whether a protein will have an iron sulfur cluster if the protein hasn't been you know, studied before. I've looked at, you know, we've solved a number of structures that aren't in the PDB right now. And so, um, you know, I've checked to see how well uh, uh, AlphaFold, you know, has agreed with the structures that we, you know, determined. And many of them are, you know, a fair amount off. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not surprised. Um... You know, on the subject of, um, of using AI for docking, the, um, the drug design data resource, which was run by Romy Amaro and Mike Gilson at uh, UCSD with, um, with the RCSB PDB playing a role, there was already evidence pre, um, pre alpha fold excitement that uh, AI approaches to understanding small molecule docking to, uh, to proteins uh, was, uh, superior, um, still not very good, but superior, and I don't want to be critical of anybody, uh, but clearly superior to more traditional methods that uh, de you know, um, depended on potential functions, etc. cetera. Um, Raphael, do you have thoughts uh, about this? Yeah, Stephen, uh, I, I think, yeah, I, I agree with Squire. I think th this is fantastic. There, it opens so many opportunities, but I, I'm, I'm also very, uh, very concerned about just, you know, the whole trash in, trash out. I think we need experimentalists, no matter what, to, to test those hypotheses, right? Uh, and this is where the, the very careful biochemistry, structural biology, cell assays come into place, because it, 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 it's, it, we, if in our group, we try to, to use AI and we try to use computational tools to predict what would be the, the better ligand. And many groups like ours still don't have access to the cutting edge technology. So we end up with something in the middle that is you know, not 50% useful, I would say. So if those tools are not made available uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a global scale, Right, uh, we are going to have a lot of uh, false positives uh, polluting our literature. So again, I think as the PDB introduced, you know, metrics and and ways to assess the quality of the data, this all has to happen to AI as well. What are the metrics we are going to use to assess all this deluge of information that we are being hit with, uh, and uh, we, we interacted with AlphaFold, just going back to, to, to them a little bit, and we, we asked them to predict the structure of a few kinases from Leishmania. And, and, and the results, I agree with everybody, is like they're great to design constructs, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still wary of, of uh, if I would actually use them uh, to dock molecules or small molecules, for example. I think maybe I'm just too old school. I, I prefer to solve the structure and take a look at the density and see if that's really what's happening. Yep. So I think we need that. We need people that are willing to get those predictions and test them in the lab 
and we need people to keep developing new metrics to assess the quality of, of, of the AI generated data. Thank you. I couldn't agree more about the importance of validation. And um, Stephen? yes, jump in. Yeah, yeah. So I think the important message or lesson from AlphaFold is that it shows how good these learning algorithms are at learning when they have a data set to learn from. And I think it's important to remember this is version one and anyone who's dealt with software knows that versions get better and better. So I think that it one, one should assume that if there is available data, these algorithms, a combination of learning and combining domain knowledge can make very good predictions. And that will be true uh, if there's a sufficient uh, data set of structures related to the protein that you're interested in. And in the future, if there are enough structures of drugs bound to proteins or proteins interacting with each other, if that information is there, these algorithms are very good at learning from it. And so I think it's going to get better and better and it's going to happen, I think, very quickly. So I, I, it's, it's uh, daunting, but I think we should all be planning for that. And, and, but I'm not, under, I'm not uh, diminishing the importance of experiment to prove the validity of these predictions, but I think that it really is an important milestone and there are going to be some really good predictions coming up as long as the data is there for the algorithms to learn from. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, John. Uh, uh, I think, but I, I'm really concerned being from Brazil that it's, it's going to be harder and harder, you know, for, from, for labs like us to have access to those tools that are not in a, a top to bottom way, you know, that, that it's going, it, I, so this is my main concern. If we don't have very good metrics and analytical tools, uh, we don't know what we're going to be dealing with. So it's, it's I think the, 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 if the, the, the algorithms are made open, which is fantastic, I think that everybody should do that. So there are ways to, for other people to learn even from the learning algorithms so they can improve so on and so forth. So uh, I think science is a, is, a, is, a, is a big endeavor that everybody needs to take part in. And uh, sometimes it's just harder for, for, for different groups to have access to that information. So like PDB is fantastic because everybody has access to everything, right? So if we could have a PDB for AI generated, you know, molecules, that, that would be fantastic. Well, I, I, I mean, there already actually is such a thing. It's called the Model Archive. It's operated by the Swiss Institute for uh, Bioinformatics. Uh, and uh, Torsten Schwede is the uh, is the leader there, uh, so I urge uh, urge all of you to um, to, to look at uh, at his work. I, I do want to be respectful of everybody's time, and uh, but I uh, I note that uh, Wayne Hendrickson is uh, uh, wants to jump in. So Wayne, please unmute. So I just, I just wanted to follow up on John's observation that if the data are there, the advances will happen and the data were there. Accolades to the PDB for this achievement. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Jane, you had your hand up as well. Uh, yes, so as a assessor of doing validation, I wanted to point out that one of the things these algorithms don't have at present is pre-curated data, which you know we and various other people are good at doing. Um, the whole PDB is a great resource, but it has a lot of invented loops that nobody saw and you know individual problems. And if we could feed these algorithms curated data, I think they would do even better. Yes, but how do you, I, I agree with you completely, but how do we curate 365,000 predicted, computed predicted structures available now on AlphaFold and 130 million available by year end? Is that what their prediction is? I that, I, that, I that's a challenge. I want to curate the PDB structures, the 180,000 or whatever, which we've already done quite a large set of. Mm -hmm. Now put this information out on places like Zenodo. And so it's several gigabytes of data at the moment. And we could certainly do more because we weren't envisioning this possible use of it. We just put it out to do bioinformatics at 
structures. Right. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, Natalie. Um, Are we ready to do thank the speakers? Thank you again for organizing this terrific session. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thanks to everyone for the incredible talks today. Lots of positive comments in the audience. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And um, I just want to reiterate uh, thanks to all of the PDB stakeholders. Uh, thank you to the PDB 50 supporters who donated money to the, uh, to the uh, Worldwide Protein Data Bank Foundation. Uh, my thanks to you for considering the, um, a donation to foundation.wwpdb.org. Um, your money will go to excellent use in uh, allowing the Worldwide Protein Data Bank partners to do things that no one funding agency will, uh, will support. Uh, we have a number of events coming up, so I just want to advertise those. Um, we'll have a day uh, at the ACS meeting on August the 25th, understanding enzyme function in 3D. The Protein Data Bank Europe is putting on a uh, two and a half day meeting at uh, EMBL, it will be virtual. Uh, bringing molecular structure to life 50 years of the PDB. That's October 20 through 22. And then PDBE and RCSB Protein Data Bank are collaborating uh, with the Royal Society of Chemistry to put on uh, two, day, two half days of training on the use of the PDB, uh, November 16 and November 18. And finally, Protein Data Bank Japan uh, will be uh, putting on a, a celebration of PDB 50 on the 24th of November as a satellite meeting to the Japanese Biophysical Society annual meeting. Uh, and uh, with, with that, I, uh, I want to stop sharing. I want to thank all of the speakers today. I want to thank my co-organizers. And I, uh, most of all, I want to thank the more than 150 people who uh, showed up today to uh, celebrate 50 years of the PDB. We will be resuming tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern with our Nobel lecture. Uh, that will be introduced by uh, ACA President David Rose. Uh, the the uh, Nobel lecturer is Francis Arnold from uh, Caltech. And then that will be followed by uh, another, uh, another session uh, with speakers uh, covering a variety of, uh, of topics. And... Um, I urge you to uh, uh, to attend tomorrow uh, from eleven to three thirty, please. Thank you, and my Thank thanks to the ACA team you. for uh, making the uh, making this virtual meeting work. Terrific job.